Um, and, and really what we're looking for is um, coming up with a, a, a new common architecture for device to cloud. Open standards and modular architectures are key to enable the maximum reuse of, of you know, kind of common or standard data objects, formats, and methods. Um, device developers can use you know, simplified um, abstracted APIs, um, as does the cloud application developer, um, kind of eliminating the complexity or hiding the complexity of the intervening uh, layers, which are now abstracted. So what are the benefits of this? Well, it really is time to market and the cost for the next thing. So as I said, we, we are a manufacturer. We, we actually build a lot of things and have bought companies that build things, but there's no way we can build everything, right? And, uh, and we don't want to. Um, so how do, we, how do we make it easier for our partners or for third-party companies to bring their expertise in sensors, actuators, you know, all the different devices that need to be uh, on a smart city uh, system. Um, how do we make it easier for them to bring the next thing to market and reduce the cost? So one way to do that is to embed an agent uh, or an SDK uh, onto the, uh, the LTE modules themselves and take advantage of the, that secure firmware extension that they can do. That way, development, maintenance, testing, updating, security, um, and the device and application protocols are really confined on the module. And they don't need to be replicated by each device ma maker. So that's a lot of expertise you don't need um, at each you know, company that's making new devices or new applications. The, the non-recurring engineering and maintenance costs or operation and maintenance costs are spread out over all of the applications and devices that use that, you know, that agent or SDK rather than um, incurred on each one by itself. Um, this also has security um, uh, and, and kind of pen testing uh, implications as well, right? Uh, because now if there's a standard uh, uh, embedded agent and it's, um, you know, well-designed, um, you have a very reduced attack area and a very well-defined uh, uh, kind of device that you can pen test against. So it makes that whole process a lot simpler. It saves a lot of money and time. Um, it, basically what it allows people to do is that the device and application makers can focus you know, where they add value on their device and their application. They don't have to implement or have expertise um, in, in some of the esoteric details of the underlying protocols. And you, if you think about this, it's no different than, you know, you, you would be expecting them to, you know, build their own LTE modem and build their own M uh, LTE, you know, firmware, right? That would be ridiculous. It would take them so much money and so much time to do it um, that they'd never make the next device. So we're, we're just essentially moving the bar out so that they can focus more on what it is that they do, you know, making the next thing, the next, you know, environmental sensor, whatever. Um, rather than worrying and, and being expert at all the underlying uh, uh, machinery that allows them to, to get the messages through. Um, so I've kind of illustrated that here. I'm showing a, a stack uh, and then kind of how it has been done, you know, the legacy way, which is the, the cyan, the blue. Um, essentially, the, the device uh, developer would have to do all of the work. Right, they would have to write all of those sections, or or integrate libraries and and debug them, and support them going forward, and patch them going forward, and you know deal deal with CVEs that come out for each and every piece of it. Um, now, what they can do is really just focus on the application data and device attributes, um, and the rest of it's kind of uh, embedded in um, the the module. Um, and, and the companies that are providing this, this agent uh, for the module, if it's not already on the module itself. So how do we do this? Um, the, the, the way that we've decided to do this, and you know, we've tried many different ways, <laughs> uh, but this is the way that we've kind of focused on now, is to use um, a standard called lightweight M2M. 
Um, this is uh, through the OMA SpecWorks uh, uh, organization. Um, and, and essentially what it allows you to do, it does a couple of things. One is it defines some common functions um, that are, or, and processes that are really, you need them for every device, every IoT device. And those are kind of listed here, bootstrapping, device configuration, firmware update, fault management, configuration and control, and reporting. Notice reporting, the actual application part of it is only one piece. Um, all of these other pieces here are, you know, had traditionally been done in kind of proprietary ways um, that, you know, are really complicated. Um, they're not easy to get right the first time. Um, and then they have pretty large attack surfaces on them so that, you know, if you don't get it right, um, you know, you may end up with a security vulnerability. By encapsulating all this functionality in, in this one standard, all these common uh, kind of operations, um, you, you have now distilled down a lot of the complexity of bringing a device online uh, and, and made it easier uh, for someone to, you know, build the next device. Um, but that wouldn't be enough, all right? So it's great that you have all the core functionalities covered. The other piece is, how do you get an application and a, and a device to be able to you know, communicate whatever it is they're communicating without having to write a, a bunch of custom code to translate you know, the type of uh, uh, attributes or data objects that they have? And so the answer there is that in OMA SpecWorks, um, they, they define and have a public repository for um, uh, data objects uh, and uh, the attributes in them. So here's an example. Um, I've got a kind of a modem uh, or a, an SOC here where there's, uh, uh, you know, embedded uh, stack. Um, there's a third party device, might have a sensor, an actuator, a street light, whatever, um, and then some interfaces to it. Um, and it's communicating with the cloud through a lightweight M2M server through some very well-defined objects that exist um, and, and some functions that you can do with those, with those objects. Um, digging into it a little bit in more detail, um, and there's a link at the top if you wanna go and take a look at the, the registry and see what's already there. There are many, many device uh, data objects and, and models already defined uh, by, uh, in this OMA uh, uh, library. Um, some contributed by Ipso, some contributed by um, Usify, some by individual companies. Anyone can create them. Um, you can build them up, you can modify them. Um, and essentially what it shows here is, you know, an object ID, the instance of whatever the resource is, you know, on off, dimmer, how much power has been consumed, what color the light is, for example whether those are mandatory or optional, whether it's a single instance or multiple instance, and then you know, what it is actually is. And the importance here is that um, on, a, on the device side, um, if I specify object 3311, for example, which is a light control, um, when I register with a server, if I just tell it that I have one of the objects that I have is 3311, it now automatically knows what I can do, right? So, and, and how to communicate it, what's readable, what's writable, um, what format it's in. Um, don't have to rewrite code on the, on the application side uh, in order to be able to uh, manipulate the next device that comes online. So that's very powerful. Um, the other thing is, is that again, going back to the, uh, the functions that I showed you uh, previously, you know, if firmware download, really complicated uh, uh, process. Uh, everybody implemented their, their own. I mean, on our devices, we have, because we've acquired several companies, we have, you know, half a dozen different ways to, to, to do firmware download uh, to our devices. Um, and uh, here's a, a common way of doing it now. This is using uh, Iodorops, uh, an example using Iodorops, uh, uh, client. Um, you can see the code for it is, is quite, uh, you know, condensed. There's not a lot you have to do. You have to define a, 
you know, a, a couple of callbacks and uh, initialize them. Uh, and then the, the, the client itself um, handles the actual dirty process of uh, moving the blocks, checking the blocks, uh, and, and finishing the actual firmware update process. And then again, this makes it a lot easier for somebody to do pen testing as well, because there's a nice well-defined set of functions that are there. Um, and, and, and it's going through a, a, a very uh, uh, limited set of uh, addresses and ports and protocols uh, that, that make it rel relatively simple to, uh, uh, to accomplish your pen testing with.